Father, we come to you here on this midweek service to once again come and honor and worship you and give you the praise that's due to you. And <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the things you've been doing in our lives. We just pray that you continue to give us safety. We pray you continue to bring justice where wrong has been done. We pray that you just look after the people in this nation, that uh, they'll be convicted and that they'll turn from their sins. And we pray, Lord, that this nation may try to right itself, that uh, it's heading down the wrong path. And so, Father, we pray that uh, our leaders will be convicted of their sins and, and, and turn this nation around, that uh, it's not going to be them directly, It's it's but if they start following your word, Lord, then things will be different. And I don't think we'll have as many... Uh, storms and things coming from you, that a lot of that's just due to sin. And so, Father, we just pray that you'll bless this service, be with your servant. Just give me the words to speak as we continue our study in Daniel and the proper understanding to teach the people. And, and Father, we, we, we know that the days are getting close, that what we're learning about is about to be fulfilled. And, Father, we want to continue to pray for Israel, allow them to quickly defeat Hamas, free their hostages, and don't be dumb in making some kind of peace deal with, with the enemy. And so, Father, we just pray that you'll bless this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> we're going to be continuing our study in Daniel. This will be Daniel part 42. And we're finishing up chapter 5, which is the chapter about the handwriting on the wall. And <clears throat> uh, just quickly, then... Um, Belshazzar, who was the king of Babylon, then if you remember, he had this big drunken fest going on. He invited the queens and the princes and the concubines and all the other people to his little drunken fest. And they had gotten the, the vessels from the, the temple, the golden and, and, and uh, silver vessels from the, that had been taken from the temple when Babylon had invaded Jerusalem. And they were drinking wine out of them and, like I say, getting drunk and and basically mocking God. And all of a sudden, then this handwriting on the wall appears on the wall. And King is disturbed. You know, he's frightened from it and, and troubled. And he doesn't know what it means. So he calls in all his wise men. None of them can understand it or anything else. And so finally, then one of the queens says, well, I know a man here. His name is Daniel. And that um, he was able to interpret things for your um, father, which we know is really what's his his grandfather that, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar and talked about how he was able to uh, give him the proper interpretations. You know, we know that he had interpreted a couple of dreams for Nebuchadnezzar as well as um, we see how God had intervened in the um, fiery furnace incident with uh, Daniel's three friends. And so anyway, Daniel's, Tells him, you know, he, well, you know, the, th the king had offered anybody that could interpret this, that he would make him the third ruler of the kingdom. Well, we already discussed that. We know that that Belshazzar, he, you know, obviously he couldn't have been the son because, like I said, if he was, he would have been the first ruler. That, but he was, you know, his dad was still in power for whatever reason. He was gone or something, and so, you know, he was acting as the king. So therefore, if Daniel was going to be made the third ruler, whoever was going to interpret it then we know that Belshazzar was really the second ruler. But he's going to be the last king of Babylon. And then, you know, Daniel has told them that, that um, you know, we know that from Daniel's dream with Nebuchadnezzar, that it's the Medo-Persian Empire that's going to uh, defeat the Babylonian Empire. And so Daniel tells them that I will interpret it, but I don't, you can keep your, I don't want to be third ruler and keep, you know, he was going to give him a gold necklace and, and clothe them in scarlet and all that. And he's like, I don't want any of that, but I'll give you the interpretation. But, you know, it's coming from God. You know, and he makes sure that he knows that it's God that gets the glory. So he starts to uh, tell him why he, you know, this hand appeared. Because he tells him about, you know, you're, you're, the, the Nebuchadnezzar, he had learned from what happened to him. If you remember, you know, he uh, had to go live out for seven years out in the grass basically lived like an animal and so forth and you know had a beast heart and says and so forth 
but yeah, he repented at the end. And I said, I believe he got saved, you know, and then God, because he has repented, he gave back his kingdom. And, and Dino tells him, well, you didn't learn anything from any of that. You should know. But yet you're here, you know, worshiping the gods of silver, gold, brass, iron, wood, and stone that, that cannot even talk or say or do anything. You know, they cannot see, they cannot hear, they don't know anything. But yet you want to praise them over the, the God that's giving you the very breath in your life. So he says, because you've done that, you know, God's going to take the kingdom from you. So Daniel tells him what the writing says. He says, it says, many, many tekel a parson. And then he tells him that many means uh, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. So that's when he tells him that the Medo-Persian Empire is going to take it over. And, you know, we're going to find out it's going to be that very night. Remember the, the one queen that said, oh, king, live forever. Well, like I said, within a few hours, you know, he was going to be dead. Then Daniel tells him that tekel means... <laughs> Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. You know, remember I said the word wanting in the King James Bible means lacking. You know, and, and you can figure, you should be able to figure that out. If you want something, why do you want it? It's because you don't have it. You know, that, that uh, you, you lack it. You know, that's why you want it, you know, whatever. So, um, you know, God says that, that the king does not measure up to God due to his sin and rejection of Jesus. You know, obviously that applies to all unsaved people that we don't weigh up if, if we reject Jesus. So, you know, he, he's been found lacking. So he's been weighed in the balances. And that's why he says that, that he's going to be, uh, you know, that his kingdom has been numbered. Now we're not, you know, he's not told directly that it's the Middle Persian Empire until we get to this next one. So we look at, let's take a look at uh, Daniel chapter 5, verse 28. So Daniel chapter 5, verse 28. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So Daniel finishes the interpretation by saying, the king's kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So this is where we see that it's going to be the Medo-Persians that are going to take over and defeat the, the Babylonians. You know, he tells them with the many, that the kingdom has been been numbered and it's been finished. You know, God's done with them. You know, the Babylon Empire, you're done. And then this is where, in verse 28, that now God tells them that it's going to be the Medo-Persians that are going to come after you. You know, and this, this goes along with, with uh, Daniel's interpretation of the dream with Nebuchadnezzar. So, so he tells them that, you know, we, that it's been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So, I mean, he even tells you that it's the Medes and Persians, just both. You know, it says Perez there, but, you know, it's it's telling you that in the verse that it's really. Because remember, initially the Medes were the uh, superior of the two kingdoms. You know, the Medo-Persian Empire was two kingdoms that had kind of merged. And the Medes originally were the stronger of the two, but eventually became the Persians that were the, the stronger one. And really, the, they basically took over. And remember that, that Persia is... Um, modern day Iran, you know, that was actually called Persia all the way up until 1923. Now, God through Daniel even lets the king know who was going to take over his kingdom. So, you know, again, we see that it's clearly from God because only God would know, you know, now, like, okay, you could say, all right, yeah, it's, it's pretty obvious looking at something like this company's going to go bankrupt or, or this, this, this nation's going to lose this war or something like that, or, you know, something's going to happen. But you know to know necessarily that um, you know it's going to be this this kingdom or something. You know only God knows the future. But as I said, said this also clearly shows who the silver kingdom was in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You know we saw that that, that in Nebuchadnezzar's dream that, that Babylon, was, you know, he was the head of gold. That they were the they were the kingdom of gold. And then we we also said then there was the silver kingdom, which was the Medo Persians. And now this this confirms it again. And then, you know, Greece was going to be the uh, the brass, and then uh, Rome was going to be the iron and the clay. But you will notice that Daniel, through the Holy Ghost, uses Perez in this verse, whereas verse 25 says, Aparsion. So if you go back and you look at, you know, verse 25, it says, this is the writing that was written, many, many tekel Aparsion. So we saw that, that many, it's... Um, you know, it's repeated twice because God wants you to know that the kingdom has been numbered. And so, um, 
you know, that, that he's finished with. And then, you know, we saw the tackle, which, which we matched up. But then you have Perez here that, um, you know, here it's been, I mean, the Parcion has been changed to Perez. And so, um, you know, but this, this is not an error. You know, this was, this is through the Holy Ghost that it's going to be, you know, God changes it from a Pars, I mean, uh, yeah, Parcion to Perez. Now, remember that Daniel chapter 5 was written in Aramaic and not Hebrew. <clears throat> the word aparsion is plural, and the U acts like an N and and, and the PH <clears throat> is changed because of the use of the U. <clears throat> so the word Perez is just the singular use of the same word aparsion, which is the plural form of the word. So let me go over that again. The, the, you have the, the parsion is plural, where the prez is just a singular, and you know, where the U acts like an and, and the PH is changed because of the use of the, the U. You know, it's kind of like sometimes like when we change an ending on certain words, you'll change the Y to an, um, an I or whatever or something. You know, it's kind of the same thing, you know, if we want to make it plural. But so prez is just the singular form of that word apart of a part a part harson. Now the particular words may have been Aramaic and God did not allow the wise men to understand them or just some unknown language. You know, there are some who say a parsion means divide in Aramaic. And we see in this verse how the kingdom of the Persians is given priority over the Medes with Perez, whereas we will see um, see soon that God mentions Darius, king of the Medes, who conquers Babylon. You know, it's, you know, they mention uh, Babylon, but I mean, uh, uh, the Medes, you know, later on with, with Darius, we'll see that in chapter six. But as I said, it's going to be the Me the Persians that really become the prominent of the two kingdoms. So as I said, this was a dual kingdom, whereas initially the Medes were more powerful, but ultimately it was the Persians who became the greater kingdom. You know, that's what we later on, you, you talk about the Persian Empire or whatever, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, so much the Medo-Persian Empire. So that's why those um, words have changed there. And so, um, you know, so there, so God, had, there's the, the interpretation of it is that, that um, the kingdom has been numbered. It's been found lacking. It's been weighed in the balances and found that it's, it's not, it's lacking, it's wanting. And then God says that it's been divided and he's going to give it to the Medes and the Persians. But like I said, so as far as, you know, we know that the, the chapter was written in Aramaic, you know, basically that's so why in one sense they could not necessarily interpret it. It could be just God purposely blinded them that it could have been in their language or it could have been some unknown language. But it was it was just the fact that that um, God didn't want them to see, you know, you could have something in your own language. We could have seen right here in English if God doesn't want you to understand it then you're just not going to, you know, you could put some unknown words there that, you know, they're quote English words, but if you've never seen them before, you're not going to understand it. So well, let's go to verse 29. So Daniel chapter five, verse 29, then commanded Belshazzar and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. So upon hearing the interpretation of the handwriting on the wall by Daniel, the king then commands for Daniel to be clothed with scarlet and a gold chain put about his neck. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the king makes a proclamation that Daniel is now the third ruler in the kingdom. Now the king at least keeps his word, unlike that is often done. You know, most of the time, you know, politicians or something, you know, oh, they promise, oh, you, you, you vote for me and I'll do this, this and that, or I'll make you this or this, that. And they never, you know, go through with their promises. But at least this king, even though he didn't necessarily was going to like what he just got told by Daniel, he at least fulfilled his end of the bargain. And so I'll at least give him that. But, you know, so Daniel becomes the third ruler here in the kingdom. Now, the king knew his kingdom was numbered and coming to an end, but he still makes Daniel the third ruler, just as he promised. 
So, like I said, he, he um, you know, what? not sure what his reasons are, but, you know, he may have done this so that the invaders would go after Daniel before they came after him, hoping he might be able to escape. You know, I don't know if he just did it just to be one of those people that actually does what he says he's going to do, or if he had an ulterior motive, like, okay, well, I don't like what's going to happen here. If, if we're going to get captured, then I'll make him, you know, go ahead and do, like I said, make him the third ruler. And then hopefully then they'll go after him first. You know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, remember when um, the king of Judah went to help with uh, um, Ahab there, the king of Israel. I can't remember which king it was, but uh, anyway, then he, you know, goes to help him. And, you know, they... The Ahab disguises himself because he tells, you know, he's going to get killed in battle. So he disguises himself, you know, where the king of Judah, he's got, you know, his royal robes on. He's got his chair. Everybody knows he's the king. Well, they're about ready to kill him because everybody said, you know, we'll just make sure we, you know, we worry about killing anybody else. We just want to make sure we kill Ahab. The enemy had been told that. And then all of a sudden they, they see the king. They're like, oh, there he is over there. And then they get close and they realize, hey, that's not, that's not Ahab. That's the other king. And so, you know, but they ended up killing him anyway because God had determined it was going to be done. But you know, it's kind of one of those things that the, even though this guy was a king, they're like, well, that's not the one we want. We want Ahab. So, you know, it's kind of like this, what he was probably hoping that maybe if this guy went and disguised as king, well, you know, they'd kill him thinking they'd kill him. You know, Ahab had gotten killed instead and he could get away. You know, it wasn't like he was doing it out of the goodness of his heart. You know, he he, you know, he was looking out for himself. And so whatever reasons that, that, that um, Belshazzar did this, then he did at the very least make... Um, Daniel, the third ruler of the kingdom. Now, as I said, the, the king knew his kingdom was coming to an end soon, and yet he and the others were not vigilant to be watching for the enemy. They were all too drunk. Now, Daniel didn't directly say here, okay, tonight's the night. He just said it's finished. You know, that he didn't say, okay, how much more time do you have? You have a day, a week, a month, whatever. You know, you have hours. He didn't say. But, you know, you would think that, they would start trying to sober up a little bit or do something to try to or find some people that were sober. That, hey, you guys start watching the gates, do something to try to keep an eye. But they didn't. Now, maybe the king did not believe Daniel that it would really happen or else thought he still had years left. You know, we don't necessarily know. Scripture doesn't say so. You know, it could be one of those things. Like I said, he just didn't believe Daniel. So he just like, well, I'm not going to go worry about this because this isn't really going to happen. Or either he still thought, all right, well, whatever, I got 10 years left, and by then I probably won't be king anyway or something. You know, but this is similar to Nebuchadnezzar, who did not repent. And it was a year later that God fulfilled his word as spoken by Daniel. But this time the king would die that very night. You know, if you remember with Nebuchadnezzar, when he had that second dream, Daniel told him that, you know, this is, you know, this is what was going to happen to him. The watchers had determined that, you know, you were going to be living this, like a beast out there for those seven years. And he didn't say, you know, exactly when it was going to happen, but he just told him it was going to happen. Well, Nebuchadnezzar had a year before it happened. So he thinks, all right, a year's passed. He's out there boasting about, look what I've done to the kingdom. And this and that. Well, then that very hour, then, you know, what Daniel said was going to happen, happened. So he kind of got away with it for a year. But God always does what he's going to do. You know, he determines, he doesn't always necessarily do everything right away. So that's our thing. We think is us. We want justice done now. You know, God doesn't always work that way. Sometimes he works years down the road. I wish he didn't do that, but he has his reasons. And so, you know, he tried to give maybe Nebuchadnezzar a chance to repent for that whole year. You know, that's maybe that's why he did it. And so, you know, maybe maybe uh, Belshazzar is thinking the same thing. Well, I've got at least a year or something, or he just didn't believe him or whatever. But unlike Nebuchadnezzar, who is not killed, as I said, and given a second chance, Belshazzar is not. Now, this is most likely because God knows the man's heart. He knew Nebuchadnezzar would repent, whereas Belshazzar was not going to, even if God had given him more time. You know, so you could say, well, that's not really fair. You know, he, he got killed out literally hours later. And yet Belshazzar, I mean, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a whole year, you know, and then he had all the stuff. So that's why he repented. But God knows the individual's heart. So he knew that, it, you know, he could give Belshazzar 50 years. He still was not going to repent. He, you know, he knows people's, people's hearts. And so, you know, he knew, and, you know, Matt Bible, why he gave Nebuchadnezzar that, you know, didn't take his life then because he knew he'd repent. Whereas Belshazzar, he knew, like, all right, 
I'm done with you. But look at verse uh, Daniel chapter 5, verse 30. Well, before we get there, then um, one more thing here. As I said, you know, Daniel became the third ruler of the kingdom. And, you know, I find it interesting. But, uh, you know, if you look, you know, the Jews have always been hated. But yet there's been certain ones that always seem to find a way to be up near in control of the, of the of, over the Gentiles there. You know, here it is, Daniel was taken captive from, Bab I mean, um, by the Babylonians there from Jerusalem. And yet he becomes the third ruler of this world empire. Now, granted, it was only briefly, but it was still, he still became the third ruler. And we're going to see that later on with the, under the Medo-Persians, you know, in the next chapter, we'll see that then um, he uh, becomes one of the, the rulers there as well. Then if you remember Joseph, you know, he became second in command you know, of there in Egypt. You know, he had become the second pharaoh, whatever you want to call him, vice pharaoh, whatever you want to call him. And, you know, he'd been sold there into slavery by his brothers. And then you remember, then he ends up becoming the second ruler of the entire kingdom. I mean, the only one that was ahead of him was Pharaoh himself. And basically he, you know, ran the, the show, not even Pharaoh. You know, he's the one that you know, gave all the food out and made the decisions. Okay, we're going to buy, you know, you have to give us your land. You have to do this and that and so forth. And then if you remember in the book of Esther, then Esther's cousin, Mordecai, then he ends up becoming, you know, of course, Esther herself becomes queen, you know, as a Jew, becomes queen. And then Mordecai, her cousin, ends up becoming second ruler over after uh, the king uh, Ahasuerus, you know, after the scheme of, um, of, oh, the evil guy there, can't think of his name, but anyway, then he, um, you know, once, once his scheme is exposed and everything and he gets killed, then um, Mordecai, he becomes, you know, is made second ruler. So, you know, there's three cases right there of, you know, of course, Daniel's three friends, they were made leaders in Babylon, so as well. But but these were leaders over the entire nation. So the uh, Haman was the guy's uh, yeah. wicked Haman that was the <laughs> leader of, uh, you know, he gets killed. You know, once his scheme, he tried to kill all the Jews. And Mordecai, you know, he had saved the king's life. And so, you know, there's three, three cases there where, you know, God used these people, even though they were in captivity and they had, different situations, you know, in one sense being punished, but yet they still got to become almost basically the ruler of those great nations. I mean, the Medo-Persians, again, they were, they were um, a world empire that, that took the place of Babylon. You know, the Egyptians, they were a world empire at the time. You know, these weren't necessarily just some little rinky-dinky country or something either. So well, look at uh, Daniel chapter 5, verse 30. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. You know, so look, uh, verse 29 says, uh, Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then verse 30, In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. So on the very night that Daniel interprets the handwriting on the wall for the king, then he is slain, you know, or means killed. And the queen told the king to live forever, and yet he was dead in hours, you know. So I just find that hilarious that, you know, they always say, oh, king live forever. And then yet, literally, he was dead within hours. Now, we don't know how much time, but, you know, we know this was during the night. You know, they're getting drunk and everything. And then obviously, the night only lasted. I mean, so, you know, obviously within what, two, three hours, maybe four hours or something, then this all happened and he was dead. So, you know, he didn't he didn't last long after this this interpretation that, um, you know, he, he uh, God, God didn't mess around, like, as I said, like he did with Nebuchadnezzar, you know, th that very night he was slain. And then look at uh, Daniel chapter five, verse 31. You know, and I, I think it too, if you notice, there's several times in the in scripture where these people, they go and get drunk. And when they, when they get drunk, then they get killed. You know, there was, I can't think of was another one of them heathen kings that he had gotten drunk too. And then his, um, 
he had been killed by, I think, his own sons or his, uh, people in his military. I don't remember now. Can't remember. He got killed. And, and um, you know, there's a couple other cases. It's like, you know, it just shows again. You know, these people, they go and get drunk. And bad things always happen to them as you die. Look at Daniel chapter 5, verse 31. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. So Darius the Median took the kingdom from Belshazzar that very night, just as Daniel had told the king. And Darius was 62 years old when he conquered the Babylonians. Now that's what three score, remember three score, a score is 20, so three of them is 60. So 62 years old when he conquered the Babylonians. So we see, just as he had said, that the Medo-Persians were going to take over the empire. Well, that's exactly what happened here. It was Darius the Median who, you know, took the kingdom. You know, as I said, originally the, the Medes were the stronger of the two halves. And that's why, you know, I think it mentions Darius the Median here because he was the kind of the leader of them. And then the Persians had their king too. But they, uh, as I said, later on would become more powerful. We'll see that. Uh, were Cyrus and stuff, you know, he was the king of Persia, and so, but, anyway, so, you know, that very night, just as Daniel had said, then they get captured, and, you know, remember, according to history or whatever, then, you know, around Babylon, they had this, uh, this huge wall that was fully wide enough that you could ride chariots, like, too wide or something, whatever it was, you know, that, there, you know, you could get multiple chariots up there on this wall and it was really tall and it was really secure. And they thought, oh, they, they had it. It's all great. But the, there was a, the Tigris river that ran right underneath through the city. And the um, Medes had dammed it up ahead of the river, you know, ahead of where, you know, before the city so that it dried up. So then they, you know, they could get underneath because there was a gate that came down to the water. So boats and things couldn't get in. But once you dried the river up, they could just walk right underneath where the river part was underneath the gate. And then they went in there into the city and took it over. But again, because they were so busy getting drunk, they didn't even notice that the water was disappearing or anything. And so, um, you know, they easily got, got conquered. But, you know, they thought they were invincible because, you know, they had the water there. They had this big wall. They had all this stuff. And, you know, when God says you're done, you're done. It doesn't matter how invincible you think you are. You know, the Titanic, you know, everybody thought, oh, this ship can't sink for nothing and this and that. You know, even God cannot sink this ship. You know, they said, well, didn't even make its first voyage and, and God sunk that ship. You know, and I think... Uh, they didn't have that last laugh. I, you know, who got the last laugh on that one? That was God. And he, you know, where's that ship now? You know, it's a mile down at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean or whatever, you know. So it's, um, you know, don't don't tempt God or whatever. That uh, um, You know, when he says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. I mean, in this case, like I said, he said that Babylon was going to be destroyed. And that very night. Medo-Persians took over, just as you said would. I mean, he even told you which kingdom was going to be. He, you know, you, so it was like, oh, is the Egyptians going to get me? Is it somebody else? No, it was the Medo-Persians, just like he said. But we'll pick it up next next week in chapter 6, and we'll take a look at uh, Darius, and we're going to see again how Daniel gets to become ruler in, in the new, new empire as well. But <clears throat> So that concludes the, the chapter on the hand running on the wall. But let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us here to once again study your word and to, uh, we see, Lord, that when you say something that's going to happen, it's going to happen. And it's going to happen just like you say and on your timing. You know, it's uh, Belshazzar, I don't know if he thought, just like Nebuchadnezzar, since you gave him a year, if he thought he had another year, if he just didn't believe you or what the deal was. But it, it happened just as you said, within that very night, he would, he was slain. And, and so, Lord, people need to learn to believe you when you say things are coming up, the tribulation here, that the, the one world government and the one world religion, the one world currency and all these other things that you, you mentioned in your word. And that they're coming soon, that the, the tribulation is going to be real, the judgments are going to be real, the deaths are going to be real, and hell is real. 
the lake of fire is real. And so, Father, people need to understand this, and they need to repent if they're not uh, saved and call upon upon you, Lord, and, and ask for Jesus to save them. Christians themselves need to repent and get right with you, Lord, and turn things around. You know, if you had, for as many people that profess to be Christians in this nation, then if as many of them say they are, truly were, or at least were living the way they're supposed to, this nation would not be in the predicament that it is. That This nation is on a quick, fast spiraling, uh, downward spiral, that it's, it's headed straight to destruction. So we pray, Lord, that those many will get saved that profess to be Christians that really are not, and a lot of the other ones that are, that they'll stop being milk Christians and get become meat Christians and, and get right with you, Lord. And then maybe some things can get temporarily turned around until the rapture comes. We pray, even so come, Lord Jesus, we pray that day will be soon. And we look forward to hearing that trumpet. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.